With that said, I would like to introduce our guests tonight. Um, um, one of the central themes we address at the American Writers Museum is identity. Who we are, how we decide who we will become. One of the most profound accomplishments of writing is the way it creates authority, the right everyone has to tell their own story. In All You Can Ever Know, Nicole Chung writes about her adoption by white parents, her search for her Korean-American birth family, and about the unspoken truths and undercurrents between people trying to see one another as clearly as they love one another. The book was named one of the season's best and most anticipated books by the Washington Post, Entertainment Weekly Time, Vanity Fair, Elle, and many other publications. Nicole's essays and articles have appeared in the New York Times, GQ, Slate, Long Reads, BuzzFeed, and Hazlitt. Among many others, she is the editor-in-chief of Catapult Magazine and the former managing editor of The Toast. Here in conversation with Nicole, <laughs> as well as Rebecca Mackay, author of the novels The Great Believers, The Hundred Year House, and The Borrower, as well as the short story collection Music for Wartime. She is artistic director of Story Studio Chicago and a recent nominee for the National Book Awards. Welcome to you both, and thank you. Thank you. All right, so the way we're gonna do this, um, we decided is we're gonna talk a little bit and then I'm gonna subtly segue into an invitation for her to read, as if it were unplanned. And then we're Which gonna talk I will some accept. more. <laughs> and then, we're, then we'll open up. Um, but um, I, I have restrained myself from tell, gushing about your books so that I can gush in front of everybody. Great. Um, <laughs> And say, so, you know, I just finished it a couple days ago because I want it to be fresh. You know, you get it in the mail and you're like, oh, I want to read this right away. And the event's three months away. That's probably not a good idea. Um, so I just finished it. And I was so taken with this as an example, among so many other things, of the ways that a, a very specific idiosyncratic story, you know, where, you know, you'd be really hard pressed to find someone with a story identical to yours, right? <laughs> this really idiosyncratic story becomes universal, becomes relevant to everyone when you dig deep enough on the thematics, when you, you know, you really, it's not about the details of what happened, it's about what it means. And all these explorations of identity, belonging, um, heritage, secrets, discovery, things that are gonna be relevant to most families, right? Um, so the first thing I want to ask you about is, you know, as you sit down to write this story originally, um, you're, you know, I'm, I'm assuming you've been thinking a lot about those concepts in a, in a kind of a heady way, because you're a thinker. It's, you're not like a random person that some stuff happened to and then you said, I better learn how to write a book. Mm -hmm. um, you're a writer. So when you went in, did you know thematically what your book was going to be about? Did you write towards those discoveries, or did you kind of did you go in, um, you know, knowing in the end what the bigger takeaways would be? I think yes, I did. I did go in knowing that obviously it is a very personal story. It's just my story. It it can't possibly represent like all Asian Americans or all adoptees, um, especially, but. Um, I did, you know, one of the benefits of memoir is that I knew, I knew the scope of the story. I knew whereabouts things would begin, what I wanted to cover, and how the story ended. Like, I didn't have to make something up. And so in that sense, yeah, the bigger things I had to think about were these thematic questions. Where are the different, um, where does the movement in the story come from? Like, how, what's going to sweep people up and keep their interest and make them keep reading? Like, what are they going to be able to take away, given that, of course, they don't share my exact experiences? And what I was thinking about from the very beginning, um, you know, even before I really thought I'd write a book about all of this, when I first started just writing sort of essays, like telling the story piecemeal, um, I, I really relied a lot on what seemed to strike a chord with readers, like what people came back and had questions about, or what they said to me about, you know, like I'm not adopted, but in my family we have like this particular estrangement or like this particular secret. Um, there's this thing that we never talk about, and every time I press, people just shut down. I was really interested in, in like what makes people keep kind of like gently, lovingly, but pers like consistently pushing on those points of like um, tension or just like secrecy within a family. Because 
as we all know, plenty of people are actually fairly content to let those things lie. And then there's like, there's like certain people who really feel the need to like keep pushing. And I realized in my like mid to late twenties, I was one of those people. Um, and that was what kind of spurred my decision to search for my birth family. But I think that curiosity, that sense of there's this thing we don't talk about, whether it's a topic or a person or an event, um, I kind of started with those big questions, like what were the big questions I had? How could I make those real to readers? How could they look at that and think about their own questions about their families and their identities? Um, and again, just the, the things that, that we're not always so comfortable talking about. That actually, it's, I'm, I'm, I want to follow up with a question about readers, yeah. um, which, you know, I think that's, a, that's something that all of us have to face at some point in drafting, right? Like the first draft is maybe much more for yourself, but then you're trying to calibrate, like, is this understandable? Have I made myself right. clear? Is this boring? Is it confusing to someone who's not literally me? Mm. Um, and I'm wondering, I'm, I'm sure that for a memoir, that paradigm shift is especially dramatic where this is stuff you've been chewing on for longer than most people chew on a novel before deciding to share it with the world. Like, this is your life. Um, and I'm curious, um, I'm, I guess it's a two-part question. I'm curious how that okay. shift was. And then I'm also curious how you envisioned your readership. And I'm partly curious because you know, you're someone who comes very much from the literary world as an editor, you're very much, you know, you're part of, you know, literary Twitter, things like that. Am I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll you are. Your word for <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, but, um, you know, this, this is a book. Um, I'm curious if you saw this book going out to kind of the esoteric literary memoir readers, or if you saw what I think seems to be happening, that it would reach a much wider audience, um, and were you thinking about approachability and all of that? You know, you sort of calibrating yourself to a certain audience. That's such an interesting question. I'm going to answer the second one first because it's freshest in my memory. Um, I was not thinking about like uh, I wasn't worried too much about um, like who it would reach. Um, I think that's like a question that the industry thinks and worries about for sure. So one of the first things that happens when you have a book idea, and I don't think I'm spilling big trade secrets here, like one of the very first questions is like about marketability. Who's the audience? Who's going to read this? Um, and I do remember getting some questions I felt were surprising a little bit because one person was like, well, what's the audience beyond adopted people? Or what's the audience beyond Asian Americans? And I just thought that was like so interesting because as an Asian American, I have always read like widely, deeply outside of my experience. I think that's why most people read. Um, but also, I just didn't grow up reading any books by Asian American writers at all. And I still grew up reading and loving books. So it didn't even occur to me that like, that sounds very naive as I say it. Um, but yeah, so I did eventually have to kind of wrestle with that and eventually just kind of stop worrying about it. Like, I'm, I'm like, I'm trying to tell a story, I'm trying to tell a true story. I'm gonna try to tell it in a way that people can access, even if they're not me, or not adopted, or not Korean. Um, and I have to kind of just trust that, like, I think that readers, I think readers are, like, interesting, and interested, and curious, and brave. And I think readers will follow writers into all kinds of different experiences and different territories. I think that's why we read. Um, so in that sense, I didn't worry too much about that. The shift like you were talking about initially, the first part of your question between taking something that is so personal that at first you are kind of writing for you and, and kind of translating it or thinking about it as an outside reader. Um, I was helped by the fact that when I started writing about adoption in the first place, like um, I was already kind of grappling with that because it was adoption is something I know so intimately. I don't know what it's like to not be adopted. so. It wasn't too hard for me to access that and write about it, but from the beginning, I know that's not most people's experience, right? Um, so, I mean, many people are adopted or touched by adoption. I've, I've heard from a lot of those people, and that's been really wonderful. But by and large, I knew I was writing for an audience that wouldn't necessarily get that the way I got it. So from the beginning, I really had to think about how can I explain this in a way that doesn't slow down the narrative, in a way that like gets across what it was like, or at least was like for me, um, and but still allows the story to move forward um, without a ton of like explanations at the beginning. Um, but I always knew that was going to be part of it, and it was even folded into my first draft a little bit, um, just because that's how I've always um, told these stories. I'd love to talk, because this is your first book, mm -hmm. and I think it's always really interesting to see um, 
in me, you know, I won't ask these questions. The audience might have questions later about, you know, sure. how you got to publish things like that. But um, what I'm really interested in is um, what about this process surprised you? What, you know, what would you not have expected? either about this book or about publishing books in general, but about, you know, that, and I'm thinking specifically about, you know, we were just talking about the difference between writing for yourself and writing for others, mm -hmm. but I'm always really interested in this is the, you know, in, in at least in book length form, the first time in someone's life that it's not just, a, it's not just the imagination of someone reading it. It's not just who would prospective readers be, but actually mm -hmm. taking it and turning it out from yourself towards the world. Um, and I know some of that stuff you can anticipate and some of it is, you know, um, kind of gobsmackingly unfamiliar. Right. Um, so are there things that, um, either about just the, the theoretical part of it, of like, wow, it's not my story anymore, or just about the publishing process that surprised you this first time? Again, like kind of working backwards, I knew always the book would go out into the world and books have a life of their own. I mean, it's still surprising to me when people come up to me and say, I loved your book. This is what I took from it. And I sometimes think like, it's not that I think they're wrong, but I sometimes they'll say things that surprise me and I'm like, oh wow, like that's not what I was thinking. Um, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that you're wrong because, because of course you're bringing your own experience and your own questions and your own curiosity to the story. Um, like there was a review where, uh, and it was a positive review, but someone said, a writer said that she thought the book was like um, a strong condemnation of like well-meaning like white people. And to be clear, like that wasn't exactly why I wrote the book. Um, but I don't necessarily think she's wrong if that's kind of one, one thing she took from it. It's just, it's interesting to see a book have a life of its own. And I think until it's out there in the world, you don't know what that's going to look like or how you will feel about it. I feel great about it. I, I, I really like that it's, I like that some of the pressure's off. I'm like, it's out there. You all will take it and run with it. Like, that's delightful to me. Um, and I like hearing about different things that people take from it. Um, the writing process, a big surprise for me was, I think, as I'd alluded to, like, I knew how the story ended. I was not, like, trying to write my way toward an ending. Although I did write, like, four different endings because I wasn't sure how to end, like... Yeah, I did, and then I... That was kind of fun. I liked it. Um, but in any case... Uh, but I knew, like, the basic events in the story, so it wasn't like that was a matter of suspense. I was not expecting... Um, you know, that said how difficult it might be to revisit and write about some of these things, and I thought... I was pretty well prepared for that, and I thought that some of these things happened 5, 10, 20 years ago. I've dealt with this. I've processed this. Writing about this won't be super difficult, and sometimes it wasn't, and sometimes it really was. Yeah. So that was definitely... And then it changed. The writing about it, of course, changed like how I thought about these things and changed how I thought about some of the, the people, I think... Um, I think I, I went in with a lot of empathy and trying to understand um, each and every person in the book, maybe even if they make decisions that we don't agree with. Like, I was trying to understand why. It, it was not ever going to be about attacking anybody, really. It was just, I wanted to try to understand every person's perspective. And um, I think my like, writing them and ha sometimes dwelling like in their perspective in the book um, really just increased my empathy for a lot of people. I think that's one of the huge strengths of the book is that, you. you know, I think um, it's hard enough to write a novel with no villain, right? Not, not that you can't, I mean, not that you shouldn't, like lots of great novels have great villains, but um, to, you know, to write a novel, I'm always impressed when someone's pulled off a novel where everyone's right, mm -hmm. you know, like, everyone's trying to do the right thing and there's still conflict, there's still yeah. something, let alone to do it with a memoir where these are real people yeah. who you have to... And one of the things I wanted to ask you about is um, you really, um, in addition to telling your own story, mm. you are in a few smaller chapters telling the story from the point of view of your sister Cindy. Right. Um, and it's, it becomes clear in those chapters that um, you know, this is a received story. You're not just imagining it. Mm -hmm. You know, she's confided this in you that you've, and it's interesting because we know, like we, we get that narratively, like sh they must have connected and become very close for her to know this stuff, which becomes the sort of narrative promise in the book. It's kind of cool. Um, but um, I'm really curious what that was like, um, both just 
artistically, writing from that other point of view, but also in terms of your relationship with your sister and the conversations you might have had around that? Yeah, I was always kind of obsessed with, um, so I did, I did meet my biological sister. It's like a minor spoiler, but not really, because um, she's introduced really early in the book. Um, I was in love with her, this story she told about, like, um, and it's not altogether happy, but I loved the story she told about, like, the day that our mother was in labor with me, very early, very unexpected, and went to the hospital and comes back and there's no baby, you know? And then, like, what does she tell my sisters? And, like, what, how do they deal with or not deal with? Or talk about or not talk about that. I was just thinking that my sister at the time was six. Like, she has very few solid memories from this period anyway, but like, she remembers that. And then she doesn't remember, you know, how they talked about it. And I was just really intrigued by that silence because I also grew up in a family where for very different reasons there were just things we didn't talk about, right? So I was interested, first of all, in introducing her as a character and her story and our stories then are sort of unfold on these parallel tracks. And I think a lot of the tension in the first part of the book comes from, you know me, you know a little bit about her, you know at some point the paths will collide, but you don't know how or when or why, you know, how that happens. Um, but I was really interested in just the different ways that, um, you know, silence was at play in both our families, you know, and the different reasons. Um, and how that also makes the act of telling the story, telling her story and my story, like very powerful and meaningful for both of us. Um, I wasn't expecting to spend so much time in her perspective. You know, there are several chapters through the book that are, um, but I just found I really liked writing in it and I had, you know, I had enough source material, I had enough information, and I wanted her to feel like a fully, I wanted her to feel as like alive and real and fully human on the page as like I did, because it did feel so much like our story and not just my story. Because um, in some sense, hers is the life I could have had. And when she was growing up wondering what it would be like to be in another family, when she met me, it was a sort of answer to that question. Um, and I wanted those two narratives to almost be in conversation with each other um, until we meet and they merge. Um, so the best way to do that was to give her like full, like I guess agency and get, kind of be in her perspective, which I was able to do because she was so generous and open and like wanted me to tell this. So that's lovely. Well, and, and talking about that, you know, the way that you build tension at the beginning, I think that's, um, You've done something really tricky where um, you start to tell your story and you don't come out with like the huge teaser of like, you know, what just wait, something crazy lies ahead or anything like that. You, you kind of drop subtle hints that the story is going to get really interesting. Um, but you do it in a really light-handed way that really draws people in. And speaking of that, would you be willing to read your opening? Oh, sure. <laughs> How did you like my segue, I'm you guys? I'm totally shocked. <laughs> yes. Um, all right, this is what I think of as the prologue to the book. Um, the story my mother told me about them was always the same. Your birth parents had just moved here from Korea. They thought they wouldn't be able to give you the life you deserved. It's the first story I can recall, one that would shape a hundred others once I was old enough and brave enough to go looking. When I was still young, Three or four, I've been told. I would crawl into my mother's lap before asking to hear it. Her arms would have encircled me, solid and strong where I was slight, pale and freckled against my light brown skin. At that age, a shiny black bowl cut and bangs would have framed my face, a stark contrast to the reddish brown perm my mother had when I was young. I was no doubt growing out of toddler cuteness by then but my mom thought I was beautiful. When you think of someone as your gift from God, maybe you can never see them as anything else. How could they give me up? I must have asked her this question a hundred times, and my mother never wavered in her response. Years later, I would wonder whether someone told her how to comfort me. If she read the advice in a book, or heard it from the adoption agency. Or if, as my parent, she simply knew what she ought to say, what I wanted to hear. The doctors told them you'd struggle all your life. 
They were very sad they couldn't keep you, but they thought adoption was the best thing for you. Even as a child, I knew my line too. They were right, Mom. By the time I was five or six years old, I'd heard the tale of my loving, selfless birth parents so many times I could recite it myself. I collected every fact I could, hoarding the sparse and faded glimpses into my past like bright favorite toys. This may be all you can ever know, I was told. It wasn't a joyful story through and through, but it was their story and mine too. The only thing we'd ever shared. And as my parents saw it, the story could have ended no other way. So when people asked about my family, my features, the fate I'd been dealt, maybe it isn't surprising how I answered. First in a childish chirrup, later in the lecturing tone of one obliged to educate. I strove to be calm and direct, never giving anything away in my voice, never changing the details. Offering the story I'd learned so early was, I thought, one way to gain acceptance. It was both the excuse for how I looked and a way of asking pardon for it. Looking back, of course, I can make out the gaps, the places where my mother and father must have made their own guesses, the pauses where harder questions could have followed. Why didn't they ask for help? What if they'd changed their minds? Would you have adopted me if you'd been able to have a child of your own? Family lore given to us as children has such hold over us, such staying power. It can form the bedrock of another kind of faith, one to rival any religion, informing our beliefs about ourselves and our families and our place in the world. When tiny traitorous doubts arose, when I felt lost or confused about all the things I couldn't know, I told myself that something as noble as my birth parent's sacrifice demanded my trust, my loyalty. They thought adoption was the best thing for you. Above all, it was a legend formed and told and told again because my parents wanted me to believe that my birth family had loved me from the start, that my parents in turn were meant to adopt me and that the story unfolded as it should have. This was the foundation on which they built our family, and as I grew, I too staked my identity on it. That story, a lifeline cast when I was too young for deeper questions, continued to bring me comfort. Years later, grown up and expecting a child of my own, I would search for my birth family, still wanting to believe in it. Thank you. So you, um, you, you had toward the end there of what you read, this lovely meditation on family lore. Um, and I was reminded as you read that of how you, you start on that note and then that really comes full circle at the end of the book when you're talking about your own daughter and um, the, you know, the stories that you're able to tell her. Um, it gets a little bit into heritage and you know, learning Korean and things like that. But, um, in addition to those, that family lore, she now has a book that she can hold in her hands, right? Uh, it's funny because we have, we, we have daughters, I think, two, right around the same age, yeah. And um, like mine's 11, yours is 10 and a half. And I mean, my 11 year old is not gonna read my massive novel about AIDS in Chicago. That's not gonna happen for a little yeah, while. Not yet, um, but, it's like a lot yeah. of gay sex. There's all kinds of stuff in there that like, <laughs> we'll wait a little, um, but, um, you know, there's not that, that temptation, but I yeah. think I, I know kids that age are so curious. I could imagine her really wanting to know what's in this book. Um, and I'm, you know, do you want to talk a little bit about how you've talked about the book with her, how you've introduced her to this idea of what this is, her role in all of it? Sure. Um, my rule with pretty much everybody in my family, not just my kids, was I don't really want the book to be the first time that you hear something about like our family or about, you know, in my daughter's case, like I guess your birth because um, I was pregnant with her and that was one of the reasons I decided to search for my birth family was this idea of 
I mean, practical things, like I didn't have a medical history and that suddenly felt very important, but also, you know, I didn't feel like I had a history, like a, a I don't know, like a culture or a connection to pass on to her. Um, I just was thinking, well, I had all these questions as a kid, like she'll have all these questions. I don't have answers, is that really good enough for her? Um, but anyway, so my rule was, I just, I wanted to talk with her about everything in the book before we read the book or before she read the book. Um, and I did that with everybody, basically. We'd already, we'd already talked about like all the topics so nobody was like shocked to find anything. Um, in my daughter's case, it's funny because, um, you know, we had talked about the one remaining piece of, of the, the story she didn't know were just some of the traumas in my birth family. Um, and so we talked pretty frankly about that and then we read the book together. Um, the book is appropriate for 10 and a half to 11 to 12 year olds in case you're wondering. Um, there's like, it, it's interesting, I didn't write it that way on purpose, but then um, when it was a junior library guild pick for like, I was like, oh yeah, that kind of makes sense, that's great, okay. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I was very excited. I'm like, now I've written a young adult book. <laughs> like, goal checked. Um, but yeah, so we, we read it together. and it When was, you say it was you read it fun. together, what do you mean? Oh, like we were reading it. So she doesn't need me to read to her, but right. we still like to read together. So, I mean, we read it like through together. Like you were reading aloud to her yeah. and she's listening. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was really neat. And so it was it was both deeply painful as a writer to read my own writing out loud oh for that God. long. Once it's done and you can't change anything. I know, it's like, awesome. I was like, I just saw a typo. I'm just going to, just hold on, sweetie. I'm going to email my publisher. <laughs> then I'll be, <laughs> be right back with you. Um, so yeah. that was kind of mortifying. But overall, it was... It was like a very, it was also really, obviously it was very moving to get to share that with her. Um, uh, and yeah, I would, you know, at the end of every chapter, I'd be like, any questions, you know, just like checking up. And uh, it was funny too, because at the end of every chapter, she'd be like, that's such a cliffhanger. <laughs> like, what happens? Can we read another chapter? And I'd be like, that's very flattering. But you know how the story ends. Like, you know this is our life. So um, I know you're angling for like a later bedtime, but like I think the flattery approach. It was really sweet and also it was just very funny. Oh, um, cool. But it's been it's been really nice to have this like tangible thing. You know, she yeah. she's so uh, she also wanted the ebook. So in addition to like the many hard copies that we have, <laughs> I got her the ebook. And she like was annotating it and she highlighted the dedication because it says like for Cindy, who's my sister and our daughters. And she highlighted it and was like, that's me. <laughs> I'm Nicole Chung's daughter. <laughs> I was like, I should sell your annotated version. Like that would make, that would be great. That would be really unethical, but it would be oh really funny God. for people. Um, oh my God. So it's been a mix of like touching and hilarious and you know, a little awkward at times to share, but um, yeah. Again, like I feel like this is her legacy too. Like it's very much her story and the story of our family. And um, you know, in particular, some of the parts about my sister and uh, her daughter, who's um, you know my my daughter's only cousin. You know, they've always known each other. They've always been part of each other's lives. They don't know, or they wouldn't know unless we told them, like everything we had to do to kind of put our family back together so that yeah. they could have an aunt, an uncle, a cousin. Um, so, I mean, I, I really wanted, I wanted her and, and now uh, my younger daughter and my niece as well just to understand like yeah. what, kind of just the steps we went through, the fact that we didn't grow up together, but we do have this close relationship and it's because we decided that we wanted it to be that way. And yeah. as a result, their family looks different, you know, yeah. than it would. Yeah. Yeah, so. that's great. Before I ask you the next question, I'm just going to tell everyone that now's a really good time to write down your question if you were thinking of that, because pretty soon, not yet, but pretty soon we'll collect them. Okay. Um, uh, it's also my opportunity to change the subject completely, um, so, so people won't notice. <laughs> no. um, so I'm curious um, about your name. Um, it's something that you get to at the end, you know, sort of at the end of the book, right? But not completely. Um, and for me, the, you know, so so Chung was not the last name you... No, not oh. a little what? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, if people didn't, I just leaned on my phone and it said hello there into the microphone. That was horrible, horrible. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, let, me tr let me start that again. Um, you know, I, maybe you want to explain so that I'm not putting words in your mouth, but it's not the name you grew up with. Mm -hmm. um, towards the end of the book, you're getting into maybe, you know, some embracing of this name. 
Um, but there's also always that question for writers of what name you choose to, to publish under. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm curious, you know, if you can talk a little bit about that. Um, sure, yeah. yeah. So uh, going by Chung and taking back my birth name. So it's the name on my original birth certificate. Um, I was born, uh, my birth name was Susan Chung. Uh, my Korean name was Su Jung. And, um, you know, I wasn't really ready to, like, claim that or any part of it, really, for a while. It was a few years after a reunion, um, after I reconnected with my birth family, where I started to think... What One thing I really wasn't comfortable with was, like, I didn't want to just kind of, like, and I still I still don't really feel like I have a right to say, like, this is, like, I, I'm not trying to assert that I belong in your family or that I'm a fully-fledged, you know, I'm not trying to say that I'm, like, really your daughter in that sense. Like, for me, taking the, my birth name back was very much about having a Korean name, like, having that link to my heritage. Um, my kids having the option someday if they want to incorporate some aspect of, you know, our Korean heritage into their names. Um, I, you know, like a lot of women who write online, I get a lot of harassment. And another reason I've just been really glad to publish under a different name than my kids is it's a different name than my kids. Um, so I never talk about, like, their, their last name anymore, and I'm very glad it's different for that reason. Um, but no, I mean, originally taking the name, and it was even before I really started writing a lot or publishing a lot. It was just a personal decision based on wanting to have this link to my Korean heritage. Yeah. Um, having always had a name that wasn't Korean and having to explain that like over and over, I was like, you know, this is, this, this would be actually pretty cool. I, I laugh too whenever I, I see it or people ask me how to pronounce it because it's extremely easy to pronounce. Um, but the, so, the, no, I mean, I, I And I'm assuming you, you grew up with a Hungarian last name like me. We both have Hungarian fathers. It was, it was really hard to, I don't talk about that either because of my parents and trying to protect their privacy. But yes, it was uncommon. I'm not asking you to say it. Oh just, yeah, no, just no like, but it was uncommon. It was only six letters. Nobody could spell it. Nobody could pronounce same, it. Same, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, just they could not. So it was difficult. And then on top of nobody being able to pronounce it, I would then have to... Like, I remember a substitute teacher, like, grilling me about it while calling and roll, and I ended up having to explain to him, like, I'm adopted, like, I know, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was like, because you look Asian, like, kind of, I'm, I'm like, I'm completely Asian, you know? Um, <laughs> and we, like, had to do this, like, at the start of English class. It was just so awkward. So I had a lifetime of experiences like that. Um, no, but I, I laugh because the social worker who, uh, like my parents, my adoptive parents had to talk with before they adopted me. Um, you know, they had asked at one point, like, what the, my birth family's name was or something, and the social worker was like, oh, it's like something foreign and, like, unpronounceable, <laughs> which I think is hilarious and, like, super racist, but also, like, it's Chung, you know? It's, it's, it's really very easy to pronounce, so... I know, I know. I have, oh. so I, I write under Mackay, which, you know, mm -hmm. is, again, six letters, Hungarian, mm -hmm. not very intuitive. But my, I legally have my husband's last name, which is Freeman. And I'm, it's always kind of a relief to give it at, like, the pharmacy where it's like, I can give my name and whatever. And every single time they're like, what? How do you spell that? Like, Freeman? Are you kidding me? Like, it's the one time yeah. in You're my like, life that I get to use this like? name is at the pharmacy yeah. and you can't spell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Um, anyway, okay, if you have a question card, we're going to pass it to the side. And um, we, I know we have several of them. I feel like we should have an, a musical interlude while we do that, but we're not going <laughs> to. If you have, like, one other question. Yeah, let's wait. see. Yeah, we have, yeah. And while we, like, and if, if there were any in the back, I don't know if we'll, uh, maybe we'll, Okay. I was going to think of another question, but maybe we'll go... Um, that's a long question. That's a really long question. Thank you. Okay. Oh, no, no. <laughs> okay. Um, there's, you know, there are two questions here that kind of go together. Okay. Um, and these are questions I'm sure you get a lot, so I'm sure you have an answer for them. The, the one question is, um, has your birth father read your book, and what was his reaction? And the other question is, did the fact that you knew that your family however you want to define that, would read the book having a chilling effect on your writing. Were there things you didn't write about for that reason? Um, my birth father has read the book. Oh, well, actually, he's working his way through it. So Korean's his first language, and he's, he is very fluent in English, but I think reads doesn't often read full-length books. And in particular, you know, it's a memoir, it's personal. I think 
I think he wanted to take his time. Um, so he, I think, is almost done with it. But I sent it to him like months before it was published just because I wanted him to have a chance. Um, and yeah, it, I think he, he's been really positive. My, my birth father is actually a writer. Um, I found this out after we reconnected. He's an essayist, which is like pretty interesting. Um, and so he's also said he's just very proud and thinks that He's like, you got that from me. And I was like, <laughs> okay, great, thanks, I guess. <laughs> um, but it, it's just kind of funny. Um, so yeah, I think he's very proud. And I think in terms of, uh, I think I'm sure parts of it were difficult to read. I mean, I do think it is like a very, I tried to keep it um, like compassionate and respectful. It was never about like, it was not about like spilling every family secret and it was definitely not intended to be like a hit piece on anybody. I just knew there were things that he'd feel like uncertain about. So I did talk with him about everything I was planning on including. Um, and I did that with my adoptive parents as well. And of course my sister. Um, and it wasn't so much like I gave everybody veto power, but I, I did, I did want to give people a chance to like correct the record if they felt I got something wrong or, um, you know, say, I mean, nobody said this, but I, I was actually wondering if somebody would say, like, don't write about this particular thing, and nobody did. I think um, my adoptive father said, you know, one thing I thought was really um, very generous, which was that, you know, this isn't the book that he or my mother would have written about our family, but that's okay, because you know, it's my memory, it's my perspective, and he really didn't feel like it was his place to, like, tell me what to, like, what to say or how to interpret things, um, which I really appreciated. So, um, I wouldn't say writing it, I had a, you know, I wouldn't say it had a chilling effect. I always knew I was going to show it to them. I knew, I knew everything in the book would be things we'd talked about before, so again, no curveballs, nobody would be shocked. Um, and I knew we'd have time to talk about it before publication, so that, you know, if there was any like longer discussion to have, we'd have it. But everybody has been really wonderful and really supportive. Um, no one asked me to pull anything out or add something in or phrase anything differently. Um, so yeah, I mean, honestly, everyone couldn't have been like nicer I'm, about it. <laughs> my own follow-up question, just out of curiosity. I know that sometimes with memoirs, certain publishing houses want you to legally clear everything with everyone. Did they? Did they ask you to have people read and That's sign off, or was so it so difficult? Because like how I mean, memory is subjective. Oh, yeah. Like it, it wouldn't even necessarily be like a lie if I remembered something differently than my mother remembered it. You know, um, but and also there's like that tricky part of like you know I think you can try to signal when you're not sure in a memoir, which I do sometimes. Like I'm not sure how old I was, but I think I was this age, or like I'm told like this. Um, but yeah, I mean. I think everybody knows you're talking about the past and memory is kind of a fuzzy, subjective thing. Um, that said, like legally, I think generally the rule in most, gosh, I mean, I don't want to be quoted on this on like the internet, but I, I think generally that if it happened to you, it, you're like considered the authority and like it's at least not actionable, like if it directly happened to you. Yeah. I think where you get into like legal issues are when it's hearsay. Yeah. Um, so yeah. That's a pleasant topic. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Please don't sue me. Um, so, yeah. Um, there's a lovely note here. I'll, I'll let you keep this one because it starts with this lovely thing about finishing the book last night and crying and feelings and all these things. Um, and um, it's very sweet. And then um, it says, for very different reasons, I've often felt alienated from um, my own culture in a society that values whiteness and encourages assimilation. What advice do you have for folks who are trying to relearn and reclaim their identities, racial or otherwise? How do you combat the imposter syndrome of somehow not being blank, Asian, Korean, whatever, enough? Um, I wish I could give you a hug. I, <laughs> I think that's such a good question and such a hard one to answer for somebody else because, um, you know, we all, we all come to this with our own baggage um, and our own scars. I think in my case, like it took a very long time for me to think, um, like at the very beginning, when I first reconnected with my birth family, I feel like it would have felt like appropriation if I had immediately started using like my birth name, even though it wasn't just their name, even though it was my birth name, like my original name. Um, I don't think, I think at first that would have felt like I didn't have a right. Um, and I've had to kind of fight that feeling off and on um, over the years when I, 
like try to learn something new or like when I started taking Korean lessons or when I try to talk to my kids about about their heritage um, you know each and every time there's that little like sort of prickle of like oh I don't really have a right to be talking about this um, but I think my best advice, if you want to call it that, and I never feel super qualified to give advice, um, is just to try to like be very gentle and patient with yourself and remember that you do have a right, like this is your identity, so, um, and nobody but you can figure out how to be like, it's not like all like Korean Americans are the same, right? Like there's a very particular type of like Korean American or you know, person that you're trying to be. Um, and it's not a space someone else can occupy, so you're not taking it from anybody. Um, my space as a Korean American who's adopted looks really different, right, than like my sisters, for example, who grew up in our, um, in, my, in our birth family. But that's not to say that like I'm less than she is in terms of our Koreanness, it's just really different. Um, I still struggle with this. I, st I think I will always, to be honest, feel like a little bit insecure in that identity. Um, so it's also okay if you feel that way, you're not alone in feeling that way. Um, but if, you know, if exploring it and learning more about it is something you want, you know, don't let those feelings keep you from, from searching. There are two other advice questions here that I'm kind of gonna roll into one. Okay. Even though they're totally different, but maybe you can, sure. <laughs> you can an, an answer them together. Um, one is, what advice do you have for an adoptee from another country from which records about the birth family are not available. And this person has a 33-year-old daughter who's interested in learning more about her birth family, or at least the tribe to which her, and I'm gonna get the mestizo mother belongs. I'm sorry if I, if I, I don't, um, I'm not doing that word right. Um, and then the other one is um, also about a, uh, an adopted daughter, which is how best to help my daughter prepare and manage expectations when and if we find her birth family. Um, what would you have wanted to help with all your questions? And this person's daughter is nine and adopted from China. Um, so just taking that one first again. Uh, one of the things I really wish that I'd had, um, well, there are a few things, like in terms of what my family could have done. Um, and I, I don't say this to cast stones, but like the, even the very idea of me searching for my birth family or finding them one day for my adoptive family was always seen as this kind of suspect um, it was something they were very wary about, um, which I understand the reasons for, but that meant we couldn't really even talk about the possibility someday, like far off in the future, that I might want to search. It was just kind of like, well, yeah, if you want to do that when you're older, you know, you can. Um, and that was kind of the extent of it. So the end result was I didn't really know if it was possible. I didn't know what the process involved. Um, I knew I couldn't really talk to my uh, adoptive family about it, at least without a lot of like awkwardness as a child. Um, and so, you know, one of the things I wish is just that that had always been an open conversation that was on the table. Um, and that also, uh, I think a lot of times when we talked about my adoption, you know, I was the one who brought it up. And I think that in a way that makes sense because of course they weren't thinking about it all the time like I was, but I think it's good if you're not always waiting for the child to bring it up, like a signal that it's a fine conversation and that it's always an open topic um, is to bring it up yourselves as parents, right? Um, so that it's not, the burden's not always on the child. Um, the other thing I wish I'd had when I was actually searching, so like if your daughter grows up someday and decides to search or find uh, her birth family, um, or even if she doesn't look for the birth family, but a lot of adoptees will like try and find out more about their culture or country of origin. Um, and like I would say, uh, I wish I'd had like a really good adoption competent therapist at the time. I did not have, I didn't really have one. I had a really good support system and it was really valuable. Um, and I was writing a lot, which helped me process things, but I didn't have um, a counselor who had any expertise in adoption or working with adoptive families or working with adoptees. Um, and I think it would have been great to just have that resource in addition. Um, so, I mean, I strongly, who amongst us would not benefit from great therapy, right? But I think, I think it can be really especially helpful when you're going through something as like monumentally life shifting as, as like a reunion with a birth family. Um, just a lot of things will come up and having somebody else there who really knows a lot about adoption um, can be really, could be really useful. Um, 
the other one was, was about... advice for someone coming from a place where there really yeah. aren't birth records available. Yeah, an adult. It's, it's weird because there are so many different types of adoption and so many different types of adoption programs. Even here, I'm a domestic adoptee, which means I was born here in the U.S. and adopted here. Um, and still, like, there are... I mean, it, those laws vary from state to state, and then like there are different types of adoption with different levels of openness or closure. Um, so, what like what you can find, what you can legally access, you know, what might be on file varies so much, like state to state, like country to country, and adoptee to adoptee. Um, so I know that just the fact that there was anything for me to find at all, I was in a very privileged position. A lot of adoptees, if they might want to search, and there might not be anything to find. Um, if there's not, like, uh, I think, well, just, it's not my situation, but I think, I know a lot of adoptees who have kind of run into dead ends over the years looking for birth family and have learned a lot about, like, their culture of origin, again, or their country of origin, um, spent time there. Sometimes they're able to find out more about a different family member, so as opposed to a parent, maybe they find instead, like, a different relative. Um, you know, that's sometimes possible, but if there really aren't, like, threads you can follow to specific relatives, I mean, you could see if, if finding out more about, like, if cultural exploration and really, um, like, spending more time maybe in country is, like, is like useful or helpful, it might not be. Um, it might not be a good substitute or a good um, thing, for, you know, for every adoptee. But I think that would have been, I imagine if I hadn't found anything, that would have been kind of my next yeah. step. Um, it was so interesting that like, obviously so much of your search was about family, but where your book ends is really on culture mm -hmm. and on embracing that for your child and feeling, right. and you wrote there it was through family, but I could right. see that that route could take other Roots. That made sense, made no sense, but yeah. <laughs> that you could have taken other roots there too. Yeah. I know a lot of adult adoptees who haven't found birth family, and for a lot of them, it does look like language lessons, and it does look like um, some of them have like taken back birth names or chosen new names, um, you know, names that are reflective of their heritage. Um, and for a lot of us, just finding like community and support with fellow adoptees is yeah. is really important. Um, I would view that as like just as important to me personally as as like searching for my birth family. Yeah. You know, that, that's been like a really important, um, it's just been very important to me as an adult adoptee. And to the, I mean, right now I hear, I hear from a lot of adoptees who've been reading the book and that's probably been the most meaningful response so far is just, you know, I've heard from adoptees as young as 15 and like as old as in their 70s of all races and backgrounds. And I know like we're, we're out there and we're looking for each other. Um, so that's been really meaningful. There's actually, there's a question here that's not for you. Okay. Um, the question is how many people in the audience are adopted? You don't have to. You don't you have to raise to. your hand, but like if you want to, I think that's kind of cool. But nice, awesome. awesome. It's a, like, yeah, that's really cool. It's yeah. really amazing that like you're, um, you know, you're giving people something to gather around with that, you know, sense of community. I could imagine, it's you know, events, book groups, all kinds of things that... Yeah, there were probably, I think so far the largest group has been um, a whole crowd came to my Seattle um, reading and that was really great. But there have been uh, like several in, in the crowd at every reading, which thank you all so much. Mm. It's really humbling and also like, it's like hard because I've heard from adoptees who've said like, you know, this is the first time I've seen anything like my story in literature and that wow. makes me really sad. Wow. Um, it, it's A, a lot of pressure and B, I feel like there should be a lot more. Like uh, yeah. my story is so particular. Like it's not gonna represent all of us or even most of us. Um, it can still really mean something to people. I'm not saying like, like growing up as an adoptee, having a story like this would have meant a lot to me, even if it wasn't yeah. like mine. But the fact that it is such an underrepresented perspective, yeah. the fact that the adoption stories we get are by and large, like not from adoptees' perspectives, especially adoptees of color, um, I think, you know, it's honestly like a problem. And this book can't, I mean, it can't address that whole void. We just need a lot more stories. Yeah. I'm racking my brain even with fiction. Like, all, I, all I'm coming up with right now is some Louise Erdrich. Like, there, you know, mm -hmm. where it, she de deals with it from a cultural perspective really interestingly, but there's, yeah, there's, there's not a lot. There's not a lot. I mean, I'm, hope, I'm hopeful it will start to change. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, we'll do two more short ones, okay. the last ones. Um, this one, this one, this person wrote two, but I'll, I'll pick one of them, which is, um, there's a couple that you see, that seek your advice about adoption before your search for your birth family. This is early in the book. And they're basically saying, you know, should we do it? Yeah. And there's a lot of interesting discussion there. Um, what is your advice 
now to such couples after your search and writing your memoir? Um, being the question yeah. being, sh you know, should basically should white people jump into adoption? Um, I don't think anybody uh, should just jump in. Well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, that's like, not quite, regardless of how you're I think that's not quite the, what they were asking yeah. you, but like, they're uh, kind of like, is it a good is, idea? This is hard. I'm asked this at every event, and I always want to just start with a disclaimer that I don't feel super qualified to give like parenting advice, as I didn't at the time. I think I was 22 mm -hmm. when I got that question from that couple. Um, I definitely understand like where the question's coming from. I don't really view adoption as like, um, you know, I write this in the book, I don't really think of it in terms, like black and white terms of like good or bad or like positive or negative, like either my own or anybody else's. Um, I just kind of, I'm more interested in like, are you going into it realistically or unrealistically? Like what kind of questions are you asking yourself? If you're adopting, if you're white and you're adopting a child of color, are you really thinking about what that child's gonna experience like within your family, within your neighborhood, what schools are they gonna go to? What do, what do your organization's community, religious and otherwise look like? You know, Would a child of color be the only one or one of a few? Or would they be the only one of their background um, or one of a few? Um, yeah, how are you preparing yourself to be their strongest, best ally? Because they are going to encounter racism in this country, it's just a fact. Um, it, so given that their race will be relevant to them and for the rest of their life, like, are you prepared like, to keep talking about that? And not just the fun cultural exploration parts, which of course are like enjoyable and like fun for families and people tend to talk about that a lot more in adoption these days, which is great, um, cultural celebration. But like, can you have the harder conversations? Are you gonna be able to talk about white privilege and white supremacy and like living in a fundamentally racist society? And if you can't do that, like, maybe there's a little bit more work to do before. Um, that's about as close as I come <laughs> ever. Yeah. And I, I think um, at times, honestly, one of the hardest things about writing a book like this or, or writing about adoption and trying to complicate a narrative that a lot of people see as very simple and very straightforward is like, I don't really say negative things about it. I think sometimes people interpret the very fact I'm trying to complicate it and ask these questions as a negative. Um, and it's not meant to be. Um, I don't, you know, I don't really, I'm, I'm definitely never going to take some kind of like anti-adoption stand. It's not who I am. Um, but I do think these are really important questions that, you know, yeah. people need to ask themselves um, and just be realistic going in. Okay, the last question um, is kind of a nice, fun one. It is, how did you decide on the book's title? Oh, well, as you maybe could tell from the prologue, um, it was, I, it started out just being like, kind of just a simple quoting of that line, like this may be all we can ever know or all you can ever know. I liked the you. I like a good like second person, like, pronoun in a title, it feels very welcoming, right? Like you're all included. Um, but then I also, you know, as I, as I think about it more and more, I've gotten hung up on the, like the limits of knowledge, like what we can know. I thought a lot about that word can and how, um, you know, for so much of my childhood, again, because there were things that we didn't talk about, I would run up against that limit of like realistically, not just what I could know, but like what we could discuss and like what I felt able to ask. Like there were these limits of just like, we didn't have many facts, but then there were also different limits of, um, of like conversation and like questions. Um, so back to that theme of like silence, uh, I think, so that was that was really where the title started to um, to feel more real was when I started thinking about those limits and we all have them in our families. I think most of us we have those things that like if you press too hard, people get a little awkward and weird with you. Um, yeah, so we know where those limits are, and I think kids are particularly good at sussing them out. Um, so that was just kind of what I was thinking about with the title. Yeah. All right, last question. This is your first time in Chicago. How do you like our weather? <laughs> um, it was, you know, it's not as bad as I was expecting. So I, I, saw, I checked the weather forecast and I was like, um, that's really cold. So uh, my new winter coat arrived just in time. Nice. But um, no, it wasn't as bad as I was expecting. I did step off the plane and for a second was like, my lungs are like, they don't feel, they don't feel good. This doesn't feel right. Um, but I live in the DC area and while it's not quite like this all the time, like we do get down to the twenties on occasion. So oh, I'm, boo -hoo. I'm, no, like I'm, no, I just want to say I'm super grateful. It's not like negative 10 because I hear that's like a regular thing here. Yeah. Um, I was like, at what, at what temperature do you just like not go outside? Like, 
I, I guess 20 below. Is it like? I guess 20 below, 10 below. You yeah. all are amazing. <laughs> you're like, you're like heroes. We're hearty. Like, you are a hearty breed. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, anyway, thank you so much thank you, for Rebecca. being here.